His name is synonymous with deception, ambition, trickery, violence, but Machiavelli wants to help people. And I think this is this is key to understanding his work. My name is Dr. Moore. I make videos about great books. We are going to talk about Machiavelli's discourses on Livy. So we, we know Machiavelli mostly from The Prince, right? That's, that's the most famous work he wrote. That's the one we always study. It's the one we assign in classes. It's the one we read. Uh, it's the one we remember. It's from The Prince that we get this idea of Machiavellianism. That's when we say Machiavellian, we're talking about the prince. But I think in in the discourses we get a a more robust, more comprehensive picture, maybe a more nuanced picture of Machiavelli, who he was and what he thought. So Machiavelli is writing about politics, about contemporary politics and ancient politics. But the way he's doing that is is by writing this interpretation of Livy, this analysis, this reading of Titus Livy's Histories of Rome. And part of the reason for that, this is a kind of classic Renaissance maneuver. Machiavelli is going back to the ancient world, really a pre-Christian world. That I think is the most important thing. Uh, he's going backward in order to move forward, right? He wants us to, to begin thinking about politics in new ways. And that means somehow uh, breaking out of the, the Christian conventions and premises of his time. And in order to do that, in order to innovate, Machiavelli needs to go back to the ancients. It's a bit unclear uh, how long it took him to write the discourses. He was, he was working on the book in 1513. That's when he's also writing The Prince. May have taken him as long as 1519 to complete it. The book begins with envy. Envy. I think that's a notable uh, thing, right? That, that envy seems to be part of his... Uh, his founding sort of image of human psychology, right? Although the envious nature of men has always made it no less dangerous to find new modes and orders than to seek unknown waters and lands, because men are more ready to blame than to praise the actions of others. Nonetheless, driven by that natural desire that has always been in me to work, without any respect, for those things I believe will bring common benefit to everyone, I have decided to take a path as yet untrodden by anyone. And if it brings me trouble and difficulty, it could also bring me reward through those who consider humanely the end of these labors of mine. So many interesting things in, in this opening paragraph. To, this is the preface to the first book, the first volume of the discourses. Um, first, he begins with envy. And then he also represents himself as an explorer, right? So this goes back to the idea of you know, Machiavelli as an innovator. He's, uh, he's charting a new course for politics, something that has not been done before, he says. But his method for doing this thing that hasn't been done before is going to be to go all the way back to ancient Rome, right? To the ancients. Uh, something very old in order to achieve something very new. What I'm going to be doing here, I think, today is, is offering the charitable interpretation of Machiavelli. I think that's what I want to do. I want to uh, read his work humanely. And I want to take him at his word. Dangerous with Machiavelli, but I want to take him at his word that he means to bring common benefit to everyone. Machiavelli wants to help us. Machiavelli wants to help people. That's what he wants. That's what he really cares about. May be surprising to you. His name is synonymous with, with deception, with uh, ambition, trickery, violence, but Machiavelli wants to help people. And I think this is this is key to understanding his work, his work in the discourses. Machiavelli, to, to sort of understand what he's trying to accomplish, we need to we need to think a bit about his project. I think the problem that Machiavelli confronts is kind of deep doubt about the relationship between politics and metaphysics. Let's put it that way. Previous political thinkers, other kinds of political thinkers, Aristotle, Plato. Christian thinkers like Aquinas, they understood politics uh, and law to be rooted in some sense in the universal, right? In, in, in the divine. Machiavelli doesn't seem to subscribe to that view. There's some debate about whether he's a Christian or not. Um, you may even find that laughable to, to even think that. But what does seem to be beyond debate is that Machiavelli doesn't seem to believe that God involves himself in human politics. 
so that it does not seem to be the case that God rewards people who are just and prudent and punishes those who are wicked and sinful, politically speaking. It might be the case that those who who do wicked things, sinful things, even evil things, succeed politically. And here I think is, is the real problem. It might be the case that a political leader can do a wicked thing, an evil thing. And not only will it bring the ruler success, the leader success, but it may result in benefits for most other people. The state may flourish because of the wickedness of the ruler, because of the wickedness of the ruler. This, I think, is is what Machiavelli perceives in the world. This is kind of the root of the idea that the the ends justify the means, right? This this notion that maybe doing the underhanded, doing the deceitful, doing the wicked or the sinful thing will result in a good end. Machiavelli will say lots of interesting things in this book about about religion. Um, he believes very strongly that there should be a state religion. He will say that at one point. Uh, he will claim that Christianity, at least as it as it is practiced in the 16th century, is politically problematic. It's not clear whether he he means by that that you know you cannot have that Christianity will not function as a state religion. I don't know if he thinks that or if he thinks there's a version of Christianity or an interpretation of Christianity that may actually function as a state religion. I think that's an open question for him. Although, I don't know, maybe it's not. But certainly as readers, I, I think there's different ways to interpret what he's saying about, about Christianity. But certainly he believes that Christianity as it exists uh, in the 16th century uh, is a political problem. But overall, Machiavelli doesn't seem to think that you know appeals to divinity or living a pious life leads to political success. Prayer does not seem to be good political policy for Machiavelli. But Machiavelli does have a pretty clear conception of the good, of what a good human life looks like. And he does seem to desire a kind of politics that promotes that kind of life, that is conducive to freedom, to security, to peace even. Uh, maybe. That one's a little little trickier. But but certainly to freedom, certainly to security, certainly to prosperity, uh, and maybe even piety. So he has this conception of the good life that looks a lot like the good life that, that we might imagine or you know, any kind of pious religious person might imagine. The question is really, how do we achieve that good life? And Machiavelli seems to think it may require extreme measures. We may need to take extreme measures to achieve that kind of a life. So as an early indication of this, I just want to look at uh, at the beginning of chapter three in volume one. Machiavelli says this, as all those demonstrate who reason on a civil way of life and as every history is full of examples, it is necessary to whoever disposes a republic and orders laws in it to presuppose that all men are bad and that they always have to use the malignity of their spirit whenever they have free opportunity for it. This is quite a fascinating claim, I think. And we need to be we need to be pretty precise about what he's saying here. Because on the one hand, he seems to be saying all men are bad. All people are bad. But I think he's saying something a, a, a bit more specific. That if you look at history or if you, you meditate upon or think about a civil way of life, you will recognize that a lawmaker needs to presuppose that all people are bad which is a little different than saying all people are bad. It's to say that good public policy, good good legislation begins from the premise that people are bad. And what he's arguing there, you know, there's there's something kind of uh, uh, proto-Hobbesian in this in this view, right? That if people are are free to choose at liberty to do what they will, they will often will bad things, right? Antisocial things. Uh, greedy things, self-interested things, things that that are contrary to to justice and community. You may disagree with that, but but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, that people are inclined that way. Lots of people are inclined that way, and uh, it makes a certain degree of sense that we would begin from the premise, right? If if we're trying to set up a a secure, free, prosperous community, that we have that in mind, right? That this this sort of drive, this this psychological reality that that people are likely to do bad things if given the choice, that we may need to begin when lawmaking 
from that premise. And so here, I think we can see a certain extremity in, in Machiavelli's political premises. Begin from the premise that all people are bad. Whew, all right. <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, oh. But his view seems to be that starting from that place gets us to a good place. And we begin to see that as he begins talking about republics. Right, the, the Prince is his book about principalities. He also talks about principalities in the discourses, but this is really his book about republics. So particularly when Machiavelli is talking about republics, the way republics are structured, we can see the way that his, his understanding of human evil might lead towards a politics that produces good ends. He talks about the six regimes. He's engaging here with, with Plato and Aristotle. What Machiavelli says about the six regimes, right? Six regimes, monarchy, aristocracy, uh, maybe like a polity, and then you've got tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. Machiavelli says, okay, uh, you know, traditionally we understand there to be three virtuous forms and three vicious forms. <laughs> but what he says about the six regimes is quite remarkable. It's, again, kind of proto-Hobbesian. He says... Those that are good are the three written above. Those that are bad are the three others depend on these three. He says, each one of them is similar to the one next to it so that they easily leap from one to the other. For the principality easily becomes tyrannical. The aristocrats with ease become a state of the few. The popular is without difficulty converted into the licentious. So he says, you know, the, the difference between a monarchy and a tyranny is not very great. Machiavelli might be thinking in particular in terms of time, that any monarchy you have in a short span of time will become a tyranny. Any aristocracy you have in a short span of time will become an oligarchy. And this leads him to say, right, again, like because human beings are bad, or you know, because most human beings are bad, or because we have bad inclinations, whatever. The result is you can't count on a monarchy staying good or uh, an aristocracy staying good those regimes will over time collapse into their vicious forms. So this then leads Machiavelli to think through how do we prevent that? How do we, we prevent the collapse of regimes into these vicious forms? And his solution, which he takes from Livy, from, from studying the Roman model, is republicanism. I say thus, that all the said modes are pestiferous because of the brevity of life in the three good ones and because of the malignity in the three bad. So those who prudently order laws, having recognized this defect, avoiding each of these modes by itself, chose one that shared in all, judging it firmer and more stable. For the one guards the other, since in one and the same city, there are the principality, the aristocrats, and the popular government. So what Machiavelli says about the Republic is that it's three regimes in one. You have in the Republic, properly constituted, a principality, an aristocracy, and some form of popular rule. And for Machiavelli, this is, uh, this is evident in the, the position of the consuls, who are like kings, the senate, which is the rule of the few, and then the many, who are given political authority, especially through the tribunes. So you have the popular will, the will of the wealthy or the virtuous, and you know the, the prudence or expertise of, of singular rulers all kind of working in a way together, but also against each other. Because Machiavelli, again, he's counting on envy, right? He's counting on, on ambition, on envy, on self-interest. But the way he sort of, what he sees in Rome and what he advises for all of us is to design a regime in such a way that these, these various competing self-interests function as a check on each other. And it's through that kind of model, Machiavelli thinks, that we will achieve political stability and that no one group or one office will be able to tyrannize over everyone else. And this, I think, is one of the striking things about, about Machiavelli's discourses is there's an emphasis throughout on institutions. I think Machiavelli, you know, if you read the discourses carefully, what you find is this trajectory away from individuals towards institutions. And the reason uh, the reason we get this emphasis on institutions is because institutions provide for stability, and it's a kind of stability in particular that will outlast the, the individual life, the mortality of any one person, and especially any one ruler. 
Because even if you have a great ruler or virtuous ruler, some kind of genius Machiavellian ruler, that guy will die. Eventually, that person will die. And once that person dies, all bets are off. And this this is communicated, I think, maybe like most effectively, most remarkably in the 10th chapter of volume one, where Machiavelli talks about Julius Caesar. Now, you know, at first you might think that Julius Caesar is exactly the kind of person that Machiavelli would admire. If you've read The Prince, you might think, well, Julius Caesar, ambitious, calculating, warlike, great general, brilliant strategist. That is that is a Machiavellian ruler if ever there was one. Incorrect. Machiavelli hates Julius Caesar. Hates him. And when you when you think about why he hates Julius Caesar, what what his critique is specifically, you start to get a sense of Machiavelli's whole project in the Discourses on Livy, and maybe you see his life's work in a different light. Because what Machiavelli says in chapter 10, he says, okay, he talks about various types of people who are uh, universally admired. And he says, founders of religions, founders of states, great generals, artists, these are the types of people that, that we admire, that we glorify. And he says, the contrary is that we vilify and denounce and, and revile people who destroy those things. And one such person is Julius Caesar. Because Julius Caesar, according to Machiavelli, and you know, I think he's right, is a person who attempted to overthrow a republic and install a dictatorship and and partly succeeded. Caesar, Machiavelli says, is responsible for all these terrible things. Not necessarily, and this is so important, not necessarily because Caesar himself was a bad ruler, but because he overturned the republic. And thus, instead of moving from individuals to institutions, we move from institutions to individuals. And what happens when we move to individuals? What happens? We move to a hereditary form of monarchy. And a hereditary monarchy, Machiavelli says, is, is basically putting yourself in the power of fortune. Luck, chance. You don't know what's going to happen. The emperor's child, who becomes the next emperor, could be great. More likely, they won't be, right? Will not be as good. And could be absolutely terrible. You have no controls for that. And the political consequences are dire. That is precisely the kind of problem that Republican institutions are designed to protect against. It's notable, too, in this section of the discourse, and Machiavelli moves from here to a long discussion of religion and the importance of religion. And he even says that Numa, who, who brought religion to Rome, is more important than Romulus, who founded Rome. And that you know suggests something about how, how the, the high priority that Machiavelli places on religion, state religion, remarkable the reason the reason he does that is because he understands that through religion right you're you're installing a kind of culture a system of virtue an account of the good life ceremonies rituals these kinds of things that will allow regimes to persist across time and that that is always what machiavelli is thinking about machiavelli cares about people and he is trying to find a way to secure regimes against Decay. Politics decays. States decay. States rise and they fall. Machiavelli says there, there's no point in, in pretending that states don't fall. States fall. How do you protect? How do you prevent collapse? He doesn't seem to believe you can do it forever. So you're really just trying to do it for as long as you can. And so institutions, religion become important parts of that. And then you can you can sustain things for as long as possible and you can prevent political decline. You can put it off as long as possible. And in that section of the discourses, he says, you know, when you've got a, a population of people who has been habituated to virtue in the kind of Machiavellian sense by good orders and good laws, then they're more likely to maintain themselves free. And disruptions, tumult, the scandals, that's not going to, to spell doom. But if people have become corrupt, uh, if if the institutions have decayed, if uh, if you know the state religion uh, has has declined, and the people have become corrupt, then then it's going to be easy for the state to collapse. And he says there is still, as in the prince, this emphasis on on great individuals, because he seems to point when things go wrong. And this is you know if, if we're Democrats, this is this is a an unsettling idea, but you know, a characteristically Machiavellian idea that you know one great person can restore order, right? Or or can 
bring about a kind of political revolution. Again, you know, because of our understanding of history, that that's a potentially disturbing idea. But he seems to believe strongly in this. Now, the limitation, of course, he says, is the lifetime of that of that great leader, that dictator. So he says that if you've got a disordered regime, you might have this this one guy who who shows up and restores order, who who revitalizes the state. But then if that person dies, then it falls back into decline, right? And he says the cause is that there cannot be one man of such long life as to have enough time to inure to good a city that has been inured to bad for a long time. If one individual of very long life or two virtuous ones continued in succession do not arrange it, when they are lacking, as was said above, it is ruined, unless indeed he makes it be reborn with many dangers and much blood. So, you know, here we get both you know, the good and bad of Machiavelli or the dark side of Machiavelli reemerges. But what do we do if we don't, you know, if we don't have the institutions in place or if our institutions are in decline? Machiavelli's answer is a little disturbing. Again, here we get this emphasis on mortality, right? So we can't count on individuals. Individuals have to give way to institutions as quickly as possible. But there's also for him always this sense that you know, when institutions have failed, when they've declined, when when whole cultures are corrupt, it's only through these these great people who are going to uh, restore or renew or innovate in a way that, you know, leads to the common good. But that act of, of restoration, of, of refounding or founding new regimes, you know, Machiavelli's clear right about this. It's it's always violent and it's always terrible and it, and it requires extraordinary measures, he says, right? So these moments of history are bloody and bad. We don't want to live in them. Machiavelli seems to think such periods are necessary because the alternative is just collapse, which which he thinks is is also also leads to uh, suffering, widespread suffering and violence and hardship and poverty, right? So for him, the comparison is not between like a peaceful, well-ordered regime and one run by, you know, a dictator. For him, the choice is between uh, the the dictatorial spirit, the you know, the armed prophet maybe who's going to come along and and set things right, or a declining state that's probably going to be conquered, right? That's going to be invaded, enslaved destroyed, whatever. Now, our criticism, I think our question for Machiavelli could be, is this a false binary, right? Is this a false choice? Isn't there maybe peace you know, as, as a third option? Maybe we don't have to choose between decline and dictator. And the other thing, you know, I think we, we need to think seriously about, you know, another thing might be, is there some other form of renewal, of institutional renewal or cultural renewal that would not require extraordinary measures, that would not require violence and suffering? That's, I think, a good question. I think the thing we'd really want to be watchful of, right, is this idea that, okay, the state is in decline, and now is the time when we need the strong-armed uh, visionary to come in and set things aright. Well, how do we know that that now is the time? Strong-armed, you know, visionaries with, with violent tendencies, they are always around, and they are always incentivized to, to overthrow existing orders and establish new orders. And uh, they're not always good. Sometimes, sometimes they're Julius Caesar, right? And they're overthrowing a, a stable regime uh, to satisfy their own ambition. So one of the real problems I think we're left with is, is when, uh, how to evaluate when we are in a state of decline and maybe in need of some innovative political genius and when the innovative political genius is actually a real threat to the common good. That's a real problem. As I said, my name is Dr. Moore. I teach great books at St. Thomas University. If you found this video useful, you might want to check out one of these over here. Thanks very much. I will talk to you soon.